Let me just do what I do. Um, Africa is the same size as North America, South America, and Europe combined. It is also the only continent that straddles the equator with no major geographic boundaries that have trapped uh, flora or fauna. And what that means is that ice ages have come and gone. Everywhere else on the world, huge you know, tracts of our biodiversity have been wiped out and it had to be repopulated. So evolution, the evolutionary clock keeps getting set back. That never happened in Africa, which means that you know, uh, it's, it's still home to most of the world's mammalian biodiversity. And you know, I'll give you an example. That's just a wildlife management area I work and like to visit. Uh, in and you know, there's a good two dozen uh, pretty large uh, four legged wandering around. Uh, we've measured as many as, as 40 species in some of the locations we've surveyed. The other thing that makes Africa a little bit special is that it's where we come from. So, all of us are Africans ultimately, uh, but most of us, you know, those of us on the paler side, we trace our ancestry to a small group of people who crossed the Red Sea at Yemen about 100,000 years ago. So we're all pretty new in the, on the block. However, humans have been in Africa for about a million years. And what that means is that there's evolutionary, you know, co-evolved relationships between human beings and, and animals in Africa that have no parallels anywhere else. And this is one of my favorites. This is a honey guide, very common bird. You often meet him in the bush, and he starts talking to you. Tuka, 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 tuka. And he's luring you to honey. So as soon as you step towards him, he's going to fly away from you, and you keep following him, you keep following him. Super cute. Has a different call for honey badgers. So has actually got kind of different lexicon for different species. Now, it has also produced these fabulous guys, and I'm a little bit obsessed with these guys, so I'm going to be shameless about that. Uh, that's the first wild lion I photographed. And, um, and this is my favorite thing in the world uh, as a hobby. Um, me hanging out in the bush with, with my pals. Um, if we didn't have a mutual understanding with lions that is built in, you could not do this. If lions treated human beings the same way they treat other large mammals, you just couldn't do this. Um, and on that particular trip, once the lads went home, I stayed around for a few days, and this particular pride uh, passed through the campsite, all 16 of them. And if the relationship between us and lions was, was normal, then um, it could have ended badly. And sometimes when those kind of norms break down, things can get pretty ugly. And just to give you some idea of like, what the cost of preserving our biodiversity can be in human terms, Tanzania loses about 300 people a year to, to lions every year. Half of those are just typical accidents. Half of them are actually lions that have gotten past their inbuilt fear of humans and have learned to hunt us as a specialist item. So that's 150 people. And like, I could tell you the stories, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't cheer you up. Um, a good example is, um, is available through the old book uh, written by an Irish, um, an Irish engineer and, and, and hunter and army officer by the name of J.H. Patterson. Um, like, if you think the movie is pretty grisly, try the book. Um, and I, one theme for this talk is going to be a book can change your life and can certainly be a hell of a lot of fun. So there's a whole bunch of movies and books recommended in there. And when I read The Man Eaters of Savo, it wasn't just the two the two star performers. If you read the book, there was man-eating lions all over Kenya doing things that are different to the lions I know. And the reason for that is, along um, with everything else, the, the scramble for Africa brought rinderpest virus from Asia, which is kind of like Ebola for cows. And, um, you know, while rinderpest doesn't affect humans directly, it's certain, you know, starving lions certainly do, and there's no vaccine for that. Uh, another great book written by an Irish vet who was involved in rolling Rinderpest back and eventually eliminating it uh, resulted in total success. So most of you would never have heard of Rinderpest because it doesn't exist anymore. The last case was a buffalo in, in Kenya and, and Rinderpest does not exist. Um, it's kind of a reflection on us as a society that measles does. So measles originates from Rinderpest. Measles is a spillover. It was the pandemic of about 3,000 years ago. I'm really glad I missed that one. It can't have been a whole lot of fun. 
But measles is with us, even though we have a great vaccine. And for us to be having measles outbreak in Ireland is just ridiculous. Most of the measles that's left on the planet is, is down to underdevelopment, um, war, famine, that kind of stuff. So, you know, we really shouldn't have it around when we've gotten rid of Rinderpest already. And we need to be very mindful of where we are in history. Like, we're only about two generations into the assumption that we'll keep all our kids. Uh, you know, and that's not, has been, not been the historical norm. Now, an unfortunate fact uh, of, is that Mother Nature tends to punish success in, in terms of pathogens. Pathogens love a highly successful organism because they become an ideal host. And never in history has there been such a, such a homogenous um, biomass pool on the planet. So currently, human beings and our livestock account for 94% of all mammalian biomass on the planet. So we're like a huge big bonfire waiting to, for a spark. And, um, and you know, this is what it looks like in other animals. So like pathogens are known to regulate biodiversity in rainforests simply by you know, any particular species that becomes very successful has a, a cordyceps fungus or a parasitoid wasp adapt to it, and that puts it back in its place. And this might seem like science fiction, uh, you know, but, but I can tell you it isn't. So a fungus growing out of the top of an ant's head sounds like science fiction, but then so does fungus growing on somebody's tongue. Now, for most physicians um, in this country, unless they're quite old, and for most of you, who might be a bit younger, you would never remember HIV before antiretrovirals. Well, th this is what it looks like. You know? and I've seen people with, with mushrooms growing on them. And that's the hard, ugly face of, um, of HIV. Now, this gentleman who I was introduced to because my wife insists that I watch Dancing with the Stars with her every Sunday night is, is Panty Bliss. In this format, he's known as Rory. Now, Rory has been done great work for public health just by being opened by his HIV status since he was infected back around, I think it was 2003, 2004, something like that. Um, and he is still with us because he was one of the first people to go on to one of some of the first antiretrovirals. At the same time, this is where I was. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, shores of Lake Victoria, West Kenya. My first job in Africa. Totally loved every second of it. Had so much fun. And this is my first photograph that I took of the local kids. And the tragedy here is, like, that, this was absolutely the peak of the HIV pandemic. Everything looked perfectly normal, but all your friends, or a lot of your friends, slowly faded away from you. And, and in those days, like, every third handshake in, on the shores of West Kenya was, was, was HIV. You know, you, to watch a third of a population fade away and disappear over the course of about five years, it's very surreal. All of these kids, a third of them lost a parent, you know, maybe two. Um, and this is what I looked like at the time. Um, you know, I know most of you young people think professors were born old and fat and grey, but, but like there was a time when I looked like you guys. And so 20 years and 20 kilos ago, this is me, you know, as, a, as wild as the wind, um, full of beans, single young man. And I can tell you, a 30% HIV prevalence is very sobering on a Saturday night. Um, now, again, it sounds like science fiction, but here's the true tale of, of HIV. You know, we've had SIV for a million years, and for a million years, people have been getting SIV and dying. Uh, but it's a very new thing that, that SIV got into people and then moved through people for long enough to adapt to people human beings well enough to engage you know, to go through full mucosal um, transmission but in the last 50 years that has actually happened three different times so suddenly we're at a point in history where lightning has struck three times and we've had three different forms of HIV emerge from three three different primate um, reservoirs and what that tells you is that how we're managing the planet has tipped in the wrong direction and once things start going wrong they tend to keep going wrong and, and if we keep going the way we're going, it's not going to end well. What had me in, in, in Western Kenya? Well, Africa is also home to all our closest relatives. And then, you know, the pandemic of 50,000 years ago that keeps me busy, because they don't all just fade away and disappear, uh, originated from gorillas. It's Falciparum malaria. And, and again, this is a book 
that changed my life primarily because of the, what I read about the lived experience of, of like the typical case of malaria in small rural places. And I I'd, I'd really I'd made sure most of these books are actually in the library so you guys can access them. Um, the malaria capers. You know, that's the acute face of malaria that we all think of. Like, I mean, it's, 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 it's a rough deal. It's a rough gig when you get malaria. I'm happy to say this little girl made it. Um, like, it's, it's, it's pretty extreme. And there's two kind of tragedies hidden in this photograph. The first one is there's one or two kids missing. So these are the kids that didn't make it through that first five years where you, you acquire immunity or you don't make it. The second part that's um, hidden in this photograph is these kids are actually not entirely themselves. If you take a thick smear in the average school, uh, historically in Africa, you would find this. You'd find um, these are the ring stages that make you feel bad. Uh, that's uh, blue for the boys and pink for the girls. I think those are the sexual stages of malaria. And so what Historically, it's been normal that you would find at least 50% of the kids have, have chronic uh, malaria infections floating around. And for years, we made the mistake of calling these asymptomatic. If you actually have big enough studies and you do the stats, what you find, there isn't a single symptom of unwellness that can't be associated with malaria infection status. It reduces uh, household output. It reduces, it knocks percentage points off national GDP growth. You know, it's just, it's, just, uh, it's bad news. And so the clinical epidemiologist sees the, the, the acute cases coming into the hospital, but actually most of the burden that malaria places on a society is actually through chronic um, infection. And in fact, a lot of the kids that die, they won't die of malaria per se. They'll be diagnosed as having pneumonia or something else because if, if you already have malaria, you know, it really tips you over the edge. Um, you know, just to give you some idea... When I started working in Tanzania, 40% of all children were classified as anemic. 10% were severely anemic, meaning here in Cork, you'd be put in an ambulance and rushed to hospital for a blood transfusion. So that was normal. Um, and the funny thing about the map of, of malaria transmission is it looks awfully like the map of poverty, and that's not an accident. And then it gets even more bizarre. That's actually the map of mosquito preferences for humans as their, their, their favorite blood source. Okay? Again, it looks like the map of poverty. And again, that's not a coincidence. And again, it comes down to our evolutionary history. We've got about four species of mosquito in Africa that have evolved specifically to feed on human beings. Um, they've evolved with, along with us. You know, some of them we can trace their ancestry right back over a million years to, to us. Some have evolved with pastoralist cultures in arid areas, others in in moist um, kind of agricultural cultures. And, and they've, they've evolved along with us, and they're really bad news, because a mosquito that has bitten somebody else before is much more likely to have picked up malaria from another person. And so we get a picture in Africa that is unparalleled anywhere else except for New Guinea. And that is where we can actually measure what's called an entomological inoculation rate. And what that means is somebody like me, in the old days when we were allowed, would go out and sit on a chair, roll up the trouser legs, and, and take out a, a tube and start catching mosquitoes as they land on you. You send them off to the lab, you test them. And, and those are the number of times that you have malaria parasites injected into your bloodstream per year. So like on this side of the spectrum, you're talking about two or three times per night. And what that means is everybody's infected all the time. Sometimes you can't detect it, but you're always infected all of the time. Um, the question is how many different strains of malaria are you carrying? And even with all the immunity in the world, because it's only partial, the actual clinical burden that you see, even the obvious stuff like people getting sick is off the scale. So, you know, this would be the number of, of malaria infections detected just in small clinics in one, in two small rural districts in, in Zambia um, that we worked with. And like, that's a lot. That's a big burden of a really life-threatening illness. So, as much time as I've spent with these guys, you know, mosquitoes scare me an awful lot more. And, and over the course of history, mosquitoes have actually killed more people than all conflicts and, and, and crimes. Uh, mosquitoes are the only animal that kills more people than people. Uh, they've shaped history. It's originally, it's an Italian word. And it's, you know, um, Rome was actually 
defended better by its swamps than by its armies. Many armies collapsed at the gates, and, um, and it was actually draining the, those pont the Pontian marshes that got Mussolini. It was a big factor in getting Mussolini into power. Malaria has had a huge shaping effect on the history of Africa, um, some of it for the better. The, the, so the, the coasts of Africa are absolutely littered with graveyards full of wannabe colonialists. And I could tell you stories about that till the cows, cows come home. You know, malaria kept Africa African for a long time and, and with it preserved her uh, fantastic biodiversity. And also 80% of all human genetic diversity and language diversity is still in Africa. Um, the scramble for Africa only began when the Spanish were introduced to chinchona bark in, in Peru, which contains quinine. So that's the natural source of quinine. And so, like, when Livingston and all the like, Mungo Park and all these, you know, um, colonial guys were wandering around Africa, they had backpacks full of this stuff to chew on. And, um, and, uh, and that's why, the, like, Africa was divided up like a cake, and there's so many straight lines coming in from the coast. Everybody head off with their back, you know, backpacks of, of quinine at the same time. And, you know, the genetic footprint of... Like, the ge the human genome is full of the footprint of, um, of malaria. Sickle cell anemia would not exist without malaria as a selective force. Um, that's a whole seminar in itself. And, and it certainly left its footprint on our family. So this is my darling wife, very patient lady. And um, as you can see from the background, she's Brazilian. Now, she looks Portuguese. She speaks Portuguese. Her name is Portuguese. Um, and the reason for that is, is in the Americas, malaria played on the, the, oasis, you know, the, the attacking side. And so malaria was a large part of the guns, germs, and steel that swept people um, out of those areas. And some of those people are gone. The Kiskea of Hispaniola, they disappeared. Um, and malaria played a, a large part in that. Now, of course, you know, I kind of put all those things to the background when I brought my wife on the second day to West Kenya. So I did, kind of did lots of sunsets and stuff and tried to avoid all, you know, any of the grim stuff. Um, and it worked very well. Now, what, what, um, what brought me to Kenya in the first place? How does an Irish guy with a PhD in pig manure biochemistry swing a job in Kenya the long way? Well, I didn't know anything about mosquitoes, but I knew a lot about plant chemistry. And when uh, a job was advertised looking for you know, plant-based repellents, um, I applied. I didn't get the job, but somebody pulled my CV out of the pile and said, come to New Orleans, work in the lab on an idea to kill mosquitoes with a vaccine. That didn't work. But I proved to be dumb enough to make a career out of mathematical modeling. So, like, the Plasmodium falciparum life cycle is incredibly complex. It's hard to believe it's just one organism encoded in one small genome. It goes through about 14 stages. Um, I couldn't understand any of the existing mathematical models, for, and that's why. You know, I'm just, I'm just not that smart. So I basically had to write my own simple ones in arithmetic format, and that's what I still teach our undergraduates today. And they can model global distribution of malaria and why different things work and other things don't work. And it's the same simple calculations that I'm kind of using to make a living today. Um, and again... You know, what was the, my experience in my first job? I arrived knowing not much, but I just made the decision to get behind everybody who, who kind of knew what they were doing. They just needed academic support. They needed help with first language, English writing, and they all needed statistical help. And I didn't have any statistical training, so I bought a book. And, and my lesson to all of you, particularly those of you young in your careers, is you are what you do. People have this idea, you do a degree and then you're locked into something. You know, you are what you do and that can keep changing. And so when people got me involved in uh, community-based uh, vector control, I said, hell yeah. And, and Richard and, and, uh, and Evan Mathenge dragged me into this whole stuff. And, you know, I never dreamed that I'd be doing all this stuff. But, but when it came, I took the chance with both hands. And, um, and again... What got me there, and one of the things that got me involved was a book that I discovered called Soper and Wilson about the elimination of an African malaria mosquito from Brazil. Actually from an area about the size of the Republic of Ireland, which sounds impossible, 
And, and this was the real, for those of you who don't believe that like a mosquito simply specializing in human beings can totally change the history of a continent, you know, the experiment has been done. Several times. Madagascar didn't have mainland African vectors. When they arrived, they wiped out about 30% of the human population. Um, this is what happened in Brazil when a, an African mosquito got in a boat from Senegal. Um, you know, there's been, same happened in Egypt. Um, fortunately for the Americas, it was eliminated down to the last mosquito with the simplest of technology. Now, this is the, mod, this is the, the equivalent of today of a mobile phone two flags, you leave one on the road with a message in it for your boss to say where to find you. The other one you carry around with you so he can find you in the bush. Um, insecticides that you can dilute in dust and so you don't have to carry around liquids. Uh, uh, a hat, a good sun hat, good sun gear, and no bicycle or motorbike or vehicle because if you're moving by that way, you're moving too fast to see a habitat that might be the size of a footprint. Okay, simple ecology, applied well. Gave me an excuse to go visit uh, the northeast of Brazil. Um, and convinced my wife to join me um, for a, a weekend on the beach afterwards. And this is what Fortaleza looks like today. I don't think that would be the case if Anopheles arabiensis had really settled in um, for some time. And with that kind of background historical knowledge, the next adventure, you know, I got a job with the Swiss Tropical, and I knew that the director had something in mind for me. And this turns out to be what it was, which was larval uh, source management in the, the city of Dar es Salaam, which at the time was the second largest or second fastest growing city in the world and about five million people. Um, so, like, maybe I look very calm about it today, but I can guarantee at the time I was extremely stressed. You know, there's nobody, nobody can give you a manual to tell you how to do this. Um, and unfortunately, I met this, this guy, Brian Sharp, and Brian had this fantastic attitude to, he ran a large regional malaria control program, and he had a policy like, ah, oh, Jerry, shut up. Yeah, just, just tell me, you know, I have a policy. If somebody comes into my office with a problem, I say, if you didn't bring a solution, get the hell out. Come back with the solution, and I'll approve it. Right. So get on with it. And, um, and so we did. And the fun part about this is that, like, the day is a very authoritarian public health implementation, you know, we do it when it's necessary, but we prefer to do it the kind of cuddly way when we can, and working with communities is a total pleasure. And Tanzania at the time had one of the best bottom-up grassroots local government schemes in the world, even though politics at the, the higher, highest level is totally undemocratic. At the grassroots level, it was excellent. And then with modern insecticides, you know, biological insecticides, bacteria that kill only mosquitoes, that can be formulated so that I can eat them when I want to take them through customs. That you can, they look like cereal, you know, perfectly safe, approved for drinking water. You can give it to communities. And they can, so at one stage we had like, you know, 300, 400 people working for us for about a tenner a week. And you can get a lot done with that. Of course, we had to adapt the methods. You know, the community members don't speak GIS. So you've got to get printed photographs and crayons and all kinds of things. And these fine gentlemen really taught me an awful lot about how to do it the right way in a sustainable way, which meant building institutional structures and people. And, you know, I think people in Africa have had enough of white people tell them what to do, or, you know, that, that kind of old vertical white saviorism kind of model. So Salim in particular, this is a slide I borrowed from him. So, like, there's two of my directors at IHI, and that's Michael Kiyama, who got partnered up with at the the Dar es Salaam Citadel Council. You know, the way that Salim put it, said, my friend, in the future, we will still be working together, but you will be working for me. And he made the point that, like, uh, at the time, Barcelona were the best football team in the world. So, yeah, but they can still find a space for Lionel Messi. You know, the, the people who want to play on the home side are very, very welcome in Africa. And so I set about changing how the money flowed. Um, and that's an unpopular job. Um, but basically shifting the money into the appropriate institution so that you have multiple careers going along different tracks that are appropriate. A city council, for example, is a great place to implement a malaria control program for. It's a terrible place to develop a research career on implementation science. So we made sure that the research money went to a local research institution 
my, my old friends at the Ifakara Health Institute. And that stuff matters. It's really boring, but it matters. And it allows this to happen. You know, Nico doesn't look so young anymore. Now he's a multi-million dollar grant holder running national surveillance programs. But you know, he cut his teeth on, on developing a new tent trap with no electricity that fits on the back of a bicycle and you can give to hundreds of people scattered around the city. Uh, Prosper developed the system for quality assuring that and making sure that you could actually run the community-based approach. Um, and it worked. We actually eliminated the most efficient malaria vector in Africa, an awfully finesse it, uh, which is really bad news. The, we gave an awfully Gambia complex a good hammering. Um, but what was very, very interesting is that, um, and as a result of that, with that larval side, so we reduced the prevalence of malaria by about 50% with that program. And there's now a factory in Kibaha where the biological insecticide is manufactured, um, run by a Tanzanian company. But the pleasant surprise that we never had anything to do with is that you know, we somehow got from 23% prevalence down to 3%. Now, how did that happen? Well, it turns out that cheap plastic netting was introduced onto the market at about the same time as we were collecting the epi, epi data. And we just got lucky in that we captured the impact of people's own personal investment in their houses just by nailing up a bit of cheap plastic netting, stuff that looks like this. This is my, my old neighbor's house. And like people take huge pride in their houses. There's only two things they spent money on, the kids' education and developing the house, even if the house takes 20 years to build. But this stuff changes everything. And so what we found was that mosquitoes that are most dependent on human beings. So like entomologists were strange people. You know, nobody else puts a, a human being in one tent and a cow in the other um, for a living and then catches mosquitoes in the two tents to see, like, what do these mosquitoes like? Do they like cows? Do they like people? Why does that matter? Because the, the mosquito that likes people is not only a more dangerous vector, it's also more vulnerable to interventions that target human beings, like a, house, a, a mosquito-proof house that starves them out of it. Um, and so that's what we found is that the behavior of the mosquito actually determines how well that intervention works. And the good news is that you can starve mosquitoes out of business. Um, and that's in a city, which is pretty easy. But here's the other end of the spectrum. This place used to hold the world record for recorded malaria transmission intensity. This is where I lived for about 14 years in Ifakara. It's the largest wetland in East Africa. And if, a bed, if something can work here, it can work anywhere. That's a bed net, okay? Other than vaccines, head and shoulders, that's the figures. So that's the high tech. Um, you don't even need a house. You know, you treat it with insecticides, it kills the mosquitoes that come close to it. And, and that has revolutionized a lot of stuff. That's just, that costs less than three bucks. Um, kids bring them home. My son used to bring them home for free. And a lot of people think that like my job is predominantly spent out in the dust looking glamorous and all that kind of stuff. And I really wish it was, but it's not true. Most of what I do that's important is actually a little bit, reminds me like this. It's, it's, you're not on the front lines. A great movie, by the way. You're sitting somewhere comfortable racking your brains, trying to think, how do we solve this damn problem? And then sometimes somebody steps in and makes sure that you have the time to think about it. So this is my daughter. Uh, when she came into the world, she refused to sleep anywhere else. So I was kept awake every night for about a good three, four months. And in that time, I wrote up a paper on, with those simple arithmetic models on basically the WHO admit the point about how bed nets really work. And how bed nets really work. Sure, they protect you physically, and that's what motivates you to use them. But how they really work is they kill all the mosquitoes that come to attack you. And that means that you're protecting all your neighbors, they're all protecting you. And actually, it means that you can eliminate entire species. So WHO swallowed this policy change hook, line, and sinker within two months. And as a result, uh, like the most important malaria vector in the world has disappeared from large chunks of Africa probably about the size of Western Europe. Uh, we were lucky that we lived in one of the places that benefited most here in Tanzania, uh, in the Rift Valley sector. And what that meant is that, um, you know, and this is what has happened to Af Africa generally, that 
the, the epidemiological profile of malaria in Africa has changed radically, uh, particularly in the drier areas. And at last count, I think there are 11 million people alive today and walking around the planet as a result of progress in the last two decades. Most of that is due to bed nets. But some people got carried away. Okay? An uncomfortable fact is that a tiny percentage of a huge number is still a very large number. So if you started off with an entomological inoculation rate of 600, and bed nets give you 99% you know, reduction of transmission, which they do, uh, and they can in some cases, you know, 1% of an EIR of 600 is six, still 600 or six exposures per year, which is enough to keep you, you know, quite sick quite often. And here's what it looks like. And this, I love this graph because it looks like a wonderful success, and it is. But it's, it's it, like both sides are true. So this is a village in Senegal, and these are the malaria incidence rates up to the point where new drugs are introduced, and then in come the bed nets. As you can see, that's dramatically reduced. But what I want you to look at is the y-axis here. That's number of cases per person per month, not per year. So that's still getting malaria once every year or two. You know, it's still, it's still a lot. So it's a huge improvement, but there's a long way to go. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? What it means is that Eleanor was about this age when she got malaria first. So she got through her first four years of life before she got malaria. And that's actually a big deal, you know, because it's a p panic at the time and you get her treated and, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. But it's once every few years. And, and most of the rest of the time, your life is normal. And that's totally different from having malaria two, three times a year, which was the norm. And, I, you know, I'm not going to say much about this, except everybody says, oh, you lived in rural Tanzania. It must have been very difficult. You know, I cannot possibly explain how much fun it was. Um, the sheer joy of rural Tanzania is fantastic. And, and we're thrilled to raise our kids there. And we all have tons of fun. And, and we continue to have tons of fun, and it's very much a part of our lives. But it's not a glamour destination. So this is Ifakara when we moved there in 2003. You know, if you want fine wines and opera, opera, it's not the place. It's not the place for you. It's certainly not a casual choice. You know, your daughter getting malaria, that's not a casual choice. There's lots of reasons not to do it. So you've kind of got to remember why you're doing this in the first place. And it actually becomes a job for the whole family because everybody in the family has to understand why you do this. And I see Deo here, you know, and you know from living in Ifakara, even amongst what Tanzania, particularly people from laboratory backgrounds, you know, most of them, they don't want to move to Ifakara, right? It's, they prefer to be in a big city with air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. And so those of us who, who have lived there and chose to live there, we're usually pretty serious about what we do. And the, but the trick with it all is to just keep a track. Why are you doing this? And it becomes very important when you're faced with choices like this. So this is, um, our work took us to Haiti, to Port-au-Prince. And we're working in the morning, basically before the, the rioters wake up. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the news from Haiti recently. Like, and it's been more or less on and off like that for, for a decade. Um, like, this is what, what Port-au-Prince looked like when I flew in, and like, there's very real possibility that I wouldn't come home or, or find myself handcuffed to some radiator in some um, kind of hostage center that some of the gangs ran. So, like, the poly needed to understand that, the kids needed to understand that, and then you've got to say, why? So why would Dad be doing these things? Well, the fun part is that it's all about people. Um, there are no innovations without innovators. And... And if you're innovating solutions to African problems, that really helps some of those, those innovators are Africans. And they, like, particularly I'm going to talk about Sheila Ogoma, you know, um, who developed a, 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 a repellent emanator based on local materials that are commonly used for, for sacking, for rice and things like that. Eventually that evolved into becoming a commercial product that is now you know, producing really good results in epidemiological trials. And, um, and it was actually testing that out against Zika vectors that took us to Haiti. Um, and, and again, it's about people. It's too late for this little guy, but, but Zika will be back. And, um, 
And in the meantime, the same vectors are transmitting dengue, chikungunya, like you, they're things you really don't want. Um, and in every setting where it's very tempting to give up and, and keep your distance, there are people trying to fix it. So these are the guys that worked, I worked with in Haiti. Um, you know, and, and poor Cyril, he's French. Uh, his wife came to Port-au-Prince, stayed for three weeks, and then got on the plane again and never came back and left him there for the, the three years. And for Chicoy and for Damus, you know, they had to, and their institution, they had to rebuild their entire university out of rubble after the 2010 earthquake. And so that's what, it, that's what the university looked like in 2010. They ran the whole thing out of tents for years. And then they had their first graduation proper ceremony, you know, a few years after that. And all of that in the face of really, I mean, Port-au-Prince is the roughest gig I've done, you know, and it just goes, always there's somebody there you can team up with. You know, there has to be a better future, and you just find those folks and work with them, and it's the most rewarding thing you could possibly do in your life. What remains ahead of us? There's basically two, there's actually three major things we need to tackle. One of them is we need to get beyond that 99% and get down to 99%, 99.99% of total of malaria transmission. We also need to preserve the gains we have. And actually, the latter is where most of my work for focuses at the moment. That bed net that you have, have passing around, basically, there's very few chemicals that are safe enough to put on something like that because a child has to be able to stick it in their mouth, which means we've got a very limited repertoire to play with, and we already have huge problems with insecticide resistance around the continent. We've overused the pyrethroid class for far too long. And so some of my work has been on just you know, with, with people like Rogoth and Sophie, working on ways to, to find cheap ways to use insecticide by, by basically kind of moving the, the protection area. The same amount of netting can actually cover all the windows and, and the eave gaps of a, of a typical house. You reduce insecticide quantity. It means you can afford to use lots of different insecticides. And you can basically start playing around with the mosquito um, by kind of, in evolutionary terms, changing the rules of the game far too often for it to keep up. Uh, and Tom Reed does uh, quite a bit of modeling on, on how that works. And you can defeat it. You can defeat evolution, but you can't undo an evolutionary bottleneck. And, and Deo, who's in the back there, you know, has spent a decade looking for insecticide susceptible mosquitoes, and we just can't find any of them in the towns and villages. Um, and so you can't bring back susceptibility traits that don't exist anymore. Something that's gone through a genetic bottleneck, there's no way back. So, you know, where would you possibly get away from insecticide pressure? It sounds like a wild excuse for me to have some fun, and it certainly was. But that's what took us into the wild. This is my f first project, and Deo and I have been working in, in the wilds of, of Tanzania, back into that uh, wildlife management area. Um, the two East Cork ladies who joined the team, like their minds are still blown. I think it'll take a couple of months for them. They lived out of tents and backpacks for 158 days. They're, it's been a wild ride, uh, but learned so much along the way about all the fabulous animals. Uh, we're the first people to demonstrate that you can figure out what a mosquito is based on linking that to the footprints and the different signs of animals. So animals you can't see in a dense forest, you can track them and you can relate that to to mosquito population dynamics. And it takes lots of kind of new logistical tricks. Deo charging his batteries for the, the, the traps, you know, with solar panels you have to carry around. Uh, you camp in some pretty gorgeous places. And, and you, you know, you've got to share that space with some of the large four-legged. And so my old friend, the lions, have been quite kind to us. They've killed a couple of things right beside the camp. Uh, and, and it's never been us. And one time they even left us with a bit of dinner. Bit stinky, but it was quite tasty. Um, Deo had to invent a backpack for carrying mosquitoes alive, humidified and cooled on foot across terrain that couldn't be passed a lot of the year. Um, you know, that's the, he had to build an entire laboratory in a forest that's also inaccessible for an awful lot of the time. And that's where all the insecticide susceptibility testing takes place. And then 
when we struggled to find susceptible mosquitoes originally in this wildlife management area, we actually had to expand the study into the newest and largest national park in Africa, Nyerere National Park. And like we, we did a field trip in December, like I can tell you that's a totally wild ride. Um, but it does take you to some spectacular places. This is the guy putting up a, a barrier netting trap to catch a, a few mozzies. And, and uh, there's like lots of people pay serious money to go uh, angling for tiger fish here. And, um, but it does have its perks. You know, Dale and I have some of the best office locations in the world uh, in the form of a trestle table. And why are we looking so happy? Because he found them. So in the Garden of Eden, we actually found, and I said the, the royal we, he, you know, Deo found mosquito, female mosquitoes that are fully susceptible to insecticides. Now, why does that matter? Because nobody lives there. It just means that there's a wild reservoir of fully diversified genomes of mosquitoes that can feed back into villages, and it changes the rules of the game for those of us who'd like to develop insecticide combinations that can reverse evolution and give us, mixed, you know, give us better efficacy over longer term for the measures we already have. Now, never one to miss a fortuitous opportunity. It did cross my mind every time I went into the WMA that, you know, every poacher got out of your way. Um, and that when you were paying for the village game scouts to escort you, you know, you came across a lot of this. So that's a charcoal bar burner's uh, bicycle abandoned with the wheels still spinning. And uh, occasionally you actually sort of bump into the gentleman himself. And, you know, I feel good because I'm carbon negative because every, this is about a week's work for this guy. And so every time you put one of these guys out of business, uh, I mean, that's a lot of carbon dioxide. And these are really high value. These are hardwood forests with deep soils. Like the environment's really worth protecting. And, you know, some of those fines and the confiscated bicycles and all that, that helps keep the little community-run WMA ticking over. And, and you get into things like just simple economics. I mean, that's kind of the next stage of this project, is just to see, help these fringe conservation areas that belong to communities and can benefit communities to, to stay viable and to, and to you know, kind of get their governance systems up and running. You find, find the community get very impassioned. And what might seem like a small amount of money to us is actually a very big deal for these folks. Um, and, you know, democracy matters. So re-election of a new committee, younger people, this made a big difference. And I'd like to point out that we like to talk about sustainability and climate action here in, in Ireland, but actually our, our habitats are pretty small beans in the overall scheme of things. The vast majority of the world's remaining biodiversity and carbon sequestration potential lies in tropical ecosystems particularly those that can be restored uh, more so than, than conserved because cause, cause, cause conservation is carbon neutral, restoration is carbon negative. Um, and so this kind of stuff matters. We, we can't all keep having cheap flights to go skiing and then get angry because there's no snow on the peak, you know, while at the same time everybody in Pakistan gets washed into the Indian Ocean. You, know, you can't go on like this. We've got to pay our way and flight, amongst other things, has to become carbon neutral. The good news is that money can hugely benefit the most isolated, um, neglected, forgotten, you know, under-resourced communities in the world. And that protects all of us. So, like the hot zones for pandemics and for like large outbreaks of really nasty things like Ebola that other people, uh, you know, not in this country, have to reel in and protect the rest of us from, it's all based around not just the most biodiverse areas, but the, bio, the most biodiverse areas where we're gnawing at them, where there's a mixed land use, where you've got, you know, non-normal interactions between humans and, and livestock and, and, and wild things that they wouldn't normally interact with. And, like, here's an example. So this is, um, this is a grocery. This is a grocery shop built inside a conservation area. Um, as you can see, there's not much in the way of protection against insects. And uh, it's about as far from a hospital as a police or anything else you can imagine. And this poor little guy, you can see he's got a big swollen spleen, so he's got malaria or schisto, or maybe both. And so these are the kind of glamorous locations where pandemics will arise from. Uh, and 
you know, I'm into vector control, so I thought it was really interesting that the cattle were better looked after than the people. So the cattle get um, the modern insecticide. The people have to burn elephant poop to protect themselves against mosquitoes. And it kind of brings me into what I've learned from this work is that, you know, there's not huge difference between the people who are making a living illicitly by sneaking into unprotected wildlife management areas that are underfunded because they don't have sustainable business models and, and displaced refugees. And somebody asked me once what I thought about how climate change would affect the malaria picture. What I said, well, it'll get, there'll be less malaria in some places and more in other places. What I'm actually more worried about is that all these changes are going to turn all of these people into refugees. Um, you know, some places are going to go dry, other places are going to get washed away. And as one Kenyan peacekeeper said recently, the hungry man is an angry man. You know, and war goes hand in hand with famine. Um, the, you know, and this is a, a pastoralist village uh, where we work, but it could easily be a, a, a settled refugee camp where people are not allowed to build with permanent materials. Um, this is a charcoal burner's camp. And because they also, you know, these guys can't afford to carry anything that, that they can't drop and leave behind them at a moment's notice. So they, they sleep totally exposed. All their cooking stuff is totally exposed. They've got rats crawling all over. You know, you name it. So that's a problem. And then there's people like Richard Allen who work on things like that. That's a bed nest basically designed for nomadic pastoralists who are going to have to move every night. So it's like um, ruggedized, made out of cotton material. And I'm happy to say that he's going to be my first PhD uh, graduate, fingers crossed, uh, at UCC. He's, he's also collecting the first PhD by prior published work for 37 years of work, uh, basically delivering vector control in humanitarian emergencies. Now, you know, it's the only PhD I've read that made me cry you know, at several points. And one fact that really just sticks with me is that I think when he started in his career at the tender age of 23, so he, might, he would have been younger than a lot of you guys in the audience here, there was something like 10 or 15 million people in the world in need of humanitarian assistance. As of January, it exceeded the population of the United States. So that's where we are. And he's seen this very clearly. You've seen the impact of climate change ramping up steadily over the last 20 years because any time there was a flood or a drought, he was on the plane. You know, and it's... it's we're, most of us are only starting to see it now. Richard has seen it for quite some time. If you really want to meet an extraordinary person, come along to this, this chat show session we're going to have with them. You know, and, and people like Richard should be the last line of defense. Uh, like, just giving Richard more money is not a solution, him and his buddies. There's a limited number of people who can kind of do this kind of work. Uh, this is also not a solution. Neither are protests in Ross Gray. You know, these are people drowning in the Mediterranean. There's too many people who are comfortable with this and don't want to talk about it. This is not a solution. Um, and let me introduce you. There's a much better solution. So let me introduce you to the greatest of them all, Hans Rosling. The world my father told me about 50 years ago was a divided world. It looked like this. Each bubble is a country. Size is population. Blue, Africa. Red, Asia. Yellow, Europe. And green, the Americas. Vertical is child mortality. From 30% of children dying before the age of five down to almost zero child death. Horizontal, number of babies born per woman. From eight to less than two. But most countries were up here. Women had six to seven children. Child deaths were free. Almost every family lost one or more children. In many people's mind, the world still looks like this, developing and developed. But it's a myth, because the world has improved immensely in the last 50 years. Here we go. Year by year, child mortality fell in almost all countries. And as child mortality fell, women chose to have fewer and fewer babies. And that enabled them to invest more time and resources in each child. By 1990, some of the so-called developing countries had already made it down here. Some were in between, 
and a few remained up here with very high child mortality. Ethiopia had hardly moved at all. It had passed through decades of famines and political turmoil. Many people think that Ethiopia is still stuck up here. But look what happens after 1990. With improved access to health service in rural areas and well-spent aid, child mortality falls dramatically in Ethiopia. And with better access to family planning, women choose to have fewer and fewer babies. Ethiopia has come halfway and is moving quickly down to this corner. But Ethiopia still faces many challenges. I will split the Ethiopian bubble. The capital, Addis Ababa, is already down here. But the remote Somali region of Ethiopia still have high child mortality. But most of the regions, 90% of the population, are centered around the average. Most people think that the problems in Africa are unsolvable. But if the poorest countries can just follow the path of Ethiopia, it's fully possible that the world will look like this in 2030. Then there will be no countries left in the box we once called the developing world. But to ensure that that happens, we must measure the progress of countries. It's only by measuring we can cross the river of myths. So occasionally somebody will share with me the view that the best thing we can do about global overpopulation is to, to just let infectious diseases run riot. And I'd be the wrong person to say that to. I'd be, certainly, I'd be the first person to take away their antibiotics the next time they're sick. You know, if they want to make the sacrifice good for them. But the, the good news is, you know, human beings are incredibly phenotypically plastic. And it's built into us that, you know, when we can keep our kids, we like to have a manageable number and we get on. And, and nobody needs to make anybody do anything. And so, if we do want to look after the planet, the best thing we can do is start by looking after the world's kids. Um, and I mean all of them. Now, where am I? So, um, the things that make me infuriated. I mean, like, some of you guys might be thinking, but like, well, Jerry seems very casual about this and all very relaxed. I guarantee you, you know, there isn't a week that goes past that I don't think about giving up. And what are the things that make me want to give up? Uh, one of them is that we have such fantastic, we know how to solve problems. So, a great example is the Global Fund. It's the best value for money in the world. It, if it was fully funded, it could make sure everybody who really needs it on the planet has everything, that, all the basics they need that we know works for malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV. Antiretrovirals, testing, counseling, bed nets, you know, TB drugs, dots, all that stuff. And that would cost about, for in the malaria field, that would cost about $10 billion a year. Now, that might sound a lot if it was in your wallet, but in the global economy, it's certainly a lot less than some of our banks make. Um, I think and the current budget of the global fund is equivalent to, but I think the, um, the, the, the MICA redress scheme, like it's, it's actually really small beans. And if you actually do the math, um, our contribution through the government to the global fund costs each of us per year less than the price of one pint of stout in a pub. I actually spent more last night in the pub kind of staring into my pint about that last night. Please tax me more. Uh, you know, these are things we can fix. They work. We're not doing it. It's small beans. And we need to kind of get around to fixing these things. And, and we need to fix the distribution of scientific capacity on the the planet, all the places that need it most are shortest on it. So that's kind of what my life has been kind of uh, centered around. The, and that means we've got to share money. So unfortunately, the vast majority of donor funding uh, dedicated to development in developing countries actually ends up being spent in, um, in high-income countries or subsidiary of high-income country institutions. And so 80% of it is actually retained. Um, I'm very proud to say in UCC we do things differently. So it's exactly the mirror image for, for the project um, that pays for my position here. 80% of it actually is, either goes directly to the Ifakara Health Institute and Sukhoini, Institute, uh, Sukhoini University in Tanzania, or we spend it on their behalf on things like PhD scholarships and stuff like that. And we get to fi fix just ridiculous things like this, that none of the advanced mathematical modeling centers dedicated to malaria 
on the planet are in a malaria endemic area. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And so that's why I kind of, these things matter. So like the nice thing about it, if you do your job right, the whole thing outgrows you. And in this photograph, all IHI people, the only person who's my student is Paul Ibrahim, and he's strapped with me. And Ibra is a, he's a, he's a, he's good with numbers. And that matters, because what's been happening so far is lots of hardworking people in, in malaria-afflicted countries upload the data, and then somebody in Oxford has all the time in the world to publish their nature papers on the basis of it. They have no idea when the data is wrong. They don't know how to speak Swahili to the minister. It's just a total disconnect. Now, there are very few species where adults live beyond reproductive age. Elephants are one, humans are another. Emer tells me that orcas and pilot whales do as well. And the reason for that is that knowledge-based cultures are really, really important. So actually, it's important. That's, so that's why I'm still, yeah, I, I think I'm past reproductive age now. You know, but this is why us old farts, we kind of hang around, is that it's all about knowledge transfer between generations. And so I don't have much time left in my career. You know, if there's anybody out there who might be interested in careers that are relevant whichever part of the world you come from, then, you know, come and talk to me. And everybody has to start somewhere. And that's why I put quite a bit of effort into these things to give people the chance to get to know each other and, and, and to understand the issues. Um, you know, and this creates opportunities. So Lucy's joined us initially as an intern, so everything has to be twins. And now she's doing her master's with us. You know, and there's... Um, and I'll give you an example. That, and that's where... These guys might look like a bunch of drunken layabouts, and they are, right? And th these are my best Tanzanian friends. But, like, he's a multi-million, he's one of the first African multi-million dollar mathematical modelers working on malaria and a few other infectious diseases. Sambo Maganga has been involved in the elimination of rabies from large tracts of Tanzania. And Nico Govella runs, you know, national surveillance programs for malaria behaviors, or, sorry, mosquito behaviors. It's actually the first of its kind in the world. You know, you gotta be safe. And like, there's a whole bunch of tricks that you gotta learn to like, to be functional and effective and, you know, and like how to survive rainstorms. And then both ladies got a spectacular case of amoebas and needed to be kind of ferried back to beds and, and saline and antibiotics. And, um, <clears throat> but, as you can see, they actually also had a really enjoyable, totally life-changing, satisfying experience. And what I would say to you is, have fun. Like it's, I'm really good at having, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, being careful, do your work hard, and then just have so much fun. And a lot of the communities and ecosystems that matter most are absolutely fabulous, and you should enjoy them. Now, what am I doing in Cork, you might ask? Well, I'm actually having an awful lot of fun here, too. And, and it turns out a lot of my hobbies, you know, following lions around, turn out to be quite useful down at the local zoo. And like I said, you know, you should have fun, but it is important to be safe. And, you know, I do enjoy that the fact that, you know, I just, I do love the glass uh, down at the photo because cause these guys aren't cuddly and they're not cute. And, um, and they've tried to eat every single one of my students. So, so kind of safety in the bush really matters. And, um, and that's that. So let me stop there. And, and happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Any questions? Well, basically, there's, there's ways to combine insecticides so that you punish mosquitoes that are resistant to one insecticide by treating with another. And one of the reasons for that is pyrethroids are actually irritants. So a mosquito that's resistant will tend to sit on the surface longer. If you've got a second insecticide on there, you actually kill off the resistant ones. So we do have ways that we can back-select susceptible, or I'll simply just change the combinations of insecticides often enough, and if it can't evolve fast enough, it'll just go out of business. So, but it really makes a huge difference 
if there's actually some wild type genomes out there that we can, that will feed into the evolutionary selection process. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was, I think that one was a brief book, is, uh, well, that's what was left after the lions finished with it. But they didn't seem to bear the presence of you like that. No, 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 I'm, I'm close with the lions, but I'm not that close. Uh, no, no, they, they just killed it and lost interest for whatever reason, so they left the head. The other question that I have is like, I wasn't clearly, I wasn't understanding about the bike thing. Are they, are they burning wood or something and making charcoal? Yes. Oh, you take it into the village and you sell it. So that's the fuel that most people. Yeah. And the reason you turn it into charcoal is it makes it lighter, so you get a more calorific value for a given weight. But like on a bike, you wouldn't believe what people bring out of the wild areas on the back of bicycles. Like 80 kilogram bags of charcoal, um, bags full of poached antelope. Um, they have any other stories? Good things. It's quiet, um, it's quiet and, and you, you'd be amazed. A timber, the whole big planks full of timber, like you wouldn't believe how much stuff you guys can carry on a bike. And they reinforce them. They put special, there's a whole culture built around how to get stuff quietly out of a wildlife management area. Anybody else? Going, going and gone. And if anybody wants to chat with me quietly, I've got until the next bus to Bandon at 8 o'clock. All right, so have a good one. Take care.